Okay, welcome everybody. Assalamu alaikum, Ramadan Mubarak. Um, inshallah, you know, week one has been great for you all and you are um, gaining the benefits of this blessed month um, in your lives, in your fast, in your community, in your family. We thank you all for being here today um, and joining us uh, with this program. Is uh, The program is Ramadan. It's a, every, year, every year we hold the Ramadan Halakha with a different theme topic. So this year's topic is stay, staying true to God. And this program will be led by Dr. Shanaz Hakani and, and Dr. Hina Azam. So Dr. Shanaz is going to present the first two weeks today and next Sunday. Inshallah, today's topic is staying true to God, compassionate change in Islam. And just to be brief, back, brief background to introduce Dr. Shanaz. And I was, Dr. Shanaz, is it okay if I call you Dr. Shanaz and not by your last name? I think I feel like I've known you for so long. <laughs> okay. Yes, Shanaz is good. All right, so Dr. Shanaz has been teaching at Mercer University since the fall of 2018 and specializes in Islam with a focus on gender and sexuality. She earned her PhD in Islamic studies at the University of Texas at Austin and her bachelor's at Emory University. Um, Dr. Uh, Shanaz's academic research and uh, research interest, research, sorry, academic and research interests include religious authority, religion, and feminism, and change in tradition. Her dissertation titled Islamic, Chain, Islamic Tradition Change and Feminism, the Gendered Non-Negotiable, uh, explored these themes focusing on Muslims in America and their attitudes toward gender and social change. Currently, she's working on a book on Muslim women's marriage to non-Muslims, surveying historical and contemporary discourse on the issue. So we welcome uh, Dr. Shanaz. And um, I'm going to hand it over to her just a bit, but I did want to just let it, you all know that there will be a, a Q&A portion at the end of this talk. So please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box. Um, there'll also be an opportunity for you just to raise your hand, use the uh, the reactions or the, the, you know, the hand raise, and we'll call on you in an orderly fashion. Um, but inshallah, this, this is going to be a, a great uh, presentation and allow you uh, an opportunity to um, interact later on. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Shinaz. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I was a bit nervous because I was like, whoa, halaqa, I've never led a halaqa before. This is, you know, it's it, it, to do stuff to do with gender and religious authority. Um, and so I'm I'm so grateful to be here. And I'm so grateful that a lot of you have uh, shown up and are joining us today. So, um, and come back next week because we'll be continuing this conversation um, on compassionate change and we'll be discussing the negotiables and non-negotiables of Islam, which is part of it is my book, uh, which just came out. So that's been on my mind, but also um, I would love for us to be able to apply that to our, to our lives and reflect on a lot of some of the questions that I'll be um, asking us today. Okay. So I, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, when I was in college, um, in undergraduate years, I between 2007 and 2011 in particular, I had some of my worst experiences with the kind of Islam that I was brought up in. It's an Islam that some of my family still practice, that a lot of my community members still practice, and I've chosen not to any longer. One that makes no room for outsiders, though for those who don't fit, and I have never really fit. The kind where if you don't break your fast at exactly the time on the timetable that the mosque gives you, then your fast, the, the entire fast is invalidated. The kind where your fast is invalidated as soon as your menstruation starts, but you still got to finish the entire fast anyway, even though it won't be accepted. The kind where it's forbidden and not simply an exemption, but an, an actual prohibition to pray or fast while you're menstruating. The kind where God is like a monster, what we call in Pashto a bow, a bala, some kind of a beast, a monster that's ready to pounce on you as soon as you make a mistake. A God that especially sets women and LGBTQ plus people and non-Muslims for failure and sin. Ask me what I mean in the Q&A. But Alhamdulillah, that's not the, the only kind of Islam that's available to us. It is one option and even more Alhamdulillah, I think, it's not the Islam that the Quran and the Prophet Sallallahu um, support at all. All of that to say then that as I struggled tremendously with my faith between 2007 and 2010, my undergraduate years, I remember when Ramadan in particular, I didn't want to fast. I fasted because I had to, and I didn't really fast, quote unquote, the traditional, the mainstream way. I would wake up for suhoor with my family, 
But then throughout the day, I resented being a Muslim. I resented the fast. I resented Ramadan. I resented every Muslim who seemed to be doing so well with Ramadan. They knew they had no questions, no doubts. But I, but I, I, I felt guilt. I especially felt guilt when I was with my family and with other Muslims who seemed to be doing the fast just perfectly. Nobody had questions. Nobody had doubts. So, but the guilt of not doing it like everyone else or not really enjoying it and not loving it was really difficult for me and it haunted me. So now I know though that, and I would, I felt like I was deceiving everybody, but now I know that I wasn't really deceiving anyone. It was never a deception because whoever didn't know my relationship, my complicated relationship with the fast and with Ramadan and the Quran and Islam and God, if they didn't know that it's because they had cultivated, they hadn't yet cultivated a safe space for me to express my truth, to express my authentic self with them. And so it really was never my fault. But so then I went to a mentor of mine, a Muslim scholar who is very intimately familiar with the consequences of stepping outside of traditional boundaries because his own mentor had been executed for heresy and for apostasy in, in their Muslim country. I was, I remember I was sobbing to him as I shared with him my struggle, my secret that I'm having these doubts and I don't really want to fast and I don't even know what the point is. I'm not getting anything out of it. And I didn't want to tell anybody, I told him, because I was like, Muslims already challenged me and questioned me as a Muslim feminist. I was already living with having my Islam and my practice of Islam, my beliefs questioned by pretty much everyone around me. And so I told him that I had doubts about everything, about the Quran, about Islam, and so on. And he was so completely nonchalant about it. He was even proud of me. I remember very, very clearly he said, congratulations to me. And I was absolutely shocked because to me, there was nothing to congratulate me about this struggle that I was, it was, it was painful. It was a very deeply painful struggle that I was facing. And he said, God loves it when we doubt things. Allah loves it when we come to conclusions for ourselves. This is your individual journey, he said. He said that if we didn't have the freedom to doubt things, then belief is not a choice. If I don't have the freedom to disbelieve, to doubt, to question things, then I don't have the freedom to believe. Belief in God and Islam then becomes not be, does not become a choice anymore. And he lived his life and did all of his work on the principle that belief is a choice. And he fought for that freedom everywhere he went for all people. So if I didn't have the freedom to doubt or to disbelieve, do I really have the freedom to believe then? We always hear Muslims, especially talking about the Quranic verses that tell us to to reason, to think, to reflect that the Quran is for those who reflect the Quran tells us. And I sometimes hear this even from Muslims who ridicule me for some of my beliefs, for challenging the status quo. And I don't think they're really reflecting here. We can't, on the one hand, throw around verses of the Quran that value reflection so much, but on the other hand, punish those who do reflect. But it sounds like we don't have the same idea of what reflection and reason mean, which is fair. That's how life works. You see, when the Quran tells us that it's for those who reflect, it's making a very powerful assumption, I have come to believe, which is that all humans are inherently oriented towards God, a concept that is very, very inherent to Islam, the idea of fitra, where we're, we're inherently oriented towards the oneness of God, Islam tells us. that. But the assumption the Quran is making here when it says reflect, reflect, think, reason, is that we will arrive at the same conclusions that God intends for us. So question everything, disagree with things, doubt everything, because whatever we do, we will ultimately return to God, to the same, to whatever this, this conclusion is that God wants from us in some form or another that is unique to us. So God's plan isn't, I truly believe now, isn't the same for everybody because our individual and collective contexts are part of who we are and why we make the decisions that we make, the journeys that we're on, the, the resources that we have, the relationship that we develop with God are part and parcel of who we are, of the context that we come from. So related to the spiritual crisis that I was facing in college, when I was in graduate school, I had mostly, this is now 2011 onwards, I had mostly found myself and was pretty satisfied with the journey that I was on. I was excited about where I was headed, where my journey was headed, and where this journey would land me eventually. But I hadn't yet made complete peace with, with the complexity of the Muslim communities that I was a part of. 
and of the historical Muslim tradition that I was so, so critical of, the practice of Islam that I had grown up with. So in 2013 then, I was taking this graduate class in the study of religion. I must have complained a lot about patriarchy in, in Muslim spaces, and I must have made it clear that I reject such practices and ideas because my teacher once asked me in, the whole, in front of the whole class, why are you still a Muslim if there's so much patriarchy in your community? And I hope he said the word community. I hope he didn't say religion. And I remember being so taken aback by this question. I, I didn't, and I still don't expect such a, such a question from a scholar or a professor of religion because I expect that they understand, scholars of religion understand how communities form, how religious traditions form, how religions develop and evolve. And the fact that people negotiate constantly in very, very complex and difficult ways with their communities, with their families, with their set with themselves, with their religious traditions, with their sacred texts to find meaning and make their texts relevant to them to themselves. But I didn't know this at the time. I was still being trained. I didn't know that this was a very careless question on my teacher's part. I know now, I know that now, after nearly a decade of, of, of studying and now teaching about the study of religion. In the moment, I knew that I had to have some kind of an answer for him. I was the only Muslim in the class. I was representing Islam. And oh, crap, I had spoken in the wrong spaces. I had criticized my tradition and my community in the wrong, in an unsafe place. I just, I just learned. It hadn't occurred to me then to be careful about who I criticized my community and my religion with, that I wasn't spiritually and psychologically and emotionally safe in every space that I was a part of, like in my classes here. So I had to come up with a really good answer right on the spot. And somehow I think I did. And I'm really proud of the answer that I gave then. But I now have a more developed answer, a more sophisticated answer as well that I'll share in a bit. You see, until then, I had never really asked myself why I am, quote unquote, still a Muslim, quote unquote, despite the patriarchy that appears to be so ingrained in the tradition and the faith that I'm so committed to. His question made so many problematic assumptions, like I mean, he assumed that patriarchy was only the enterprise of Islam, of Muslims, of the Islamic tradition, of my community. I, I, wondered, I wonder now if he would ask a feminist non-Muslim person, like a Christian feminist, the same question. Why are you still a Christian if there's so much misogyny in your community, in your faith, in your church that you're devoted to? Is patriarchy a problem only in religious contexts? Fun fact, it's not. Is it even possible for me to leave Islam and suddenly begin to be a citizen of a world without patriarchy? In other words, does a world without patriarchy currently even exist? And most disturbingly, I think, can only misogynists lay a claim to Islam as their faith, leaving all non-misogynists no other choice than to walk out of it, to stop investing in it? So in my response to him, I remember saying that I was still a Muslim because doing so would mean that Islam is inherently patriarchal and that patriarchy exists on, and that patriarchy doesn't exist only in Islam or and that it would mean that it does if I left. And I refused to leave the religion to misogynists because I knew that there was room in Islam for all of us, including for me. When Muslims, when Muslims come to me ex uh, today, when Muslims come to me expressing hopelessness and wonder if our fight for egalitarianism is worth it, my answer is always an unequivocal, unapologetic yes. Our fight will always be worth the struggles that we're facing right now. And this is because, and it's also part of uh, the answer that I have developed now to the question that my teacher was asking me in 2013, Islam, quote unquote Islam, as we know it today, is a process and it is a project of the, gener the generations of Muslims before us who practiced Islam a certain way. It is a journey. It's not a destination and it is not a conclusion. And its teachings, besides what I think are probably the most essential, the teachings, monotheism, the belief in the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as God's prophet and in one God, the rest of the teachings are largely a matter not so much of truth, but of power, which is to say that what a specific belief in Islam means is not a matter of some objective, quote unquote, truth, but of who has enough political and social power and influence to make it appear true, to, to endorse it so that it becomes mainstream. We have, there are thousands of books written on this topic of how something becomes, an idea becomes mainstream, which political leaders of a, of a specific time period sponsored a particular idea, a particular fatwa by a specific scholar and so on. 
Sunnis, for example, break their fast at exactly the time on the timetable, not because that is the objective and the only correct way to do it, but because it is an important way for them to distinguish themselves from the Shia Muslims whose interpretation of the fasting verses is, is that the fast is to be broken when it's dark, which I think is the correct in, uh, interpretation of the Quranic verses because the Quranic verses on fasting uh, don't actually say sunset, uh, but something about darkness. So it's a metaphorical language there as well. So there's a lot of room for interpretations because religions are weird like that. So we inconsistently use them as a tool to uh, inconsistency, inconsistently use our differences or the specific interpretations that, of, of Islam that we, come with, uh, that we come to as a tool to differentiate ourselves from the group that we identify as an enemy, as an other. And um, I'm gonna plug a book here. Uh, Yusha Patel has a, Yusha, Yusha Patel has a, wonderful, brilliant book on the on this idea of not being like the other. And it's called The Muslim Difference, Defining the Line Between Believers and Unbelievers from Early Islam to the Present. I recommend it highly. I did an interview with him on the New Books podcast, if you'd like to uh, listen to the interview before you get the book. But it's, it's about how boundary making works, how um, Muslim scholars historically and just Muslims in general have decided when something is completely un-Islamic because it, you know it's like it's it, if we do this it's like being like the other um, and when it's okay to be like the other because we're not consistent like that at all. So ultimately what this has taught me is that if patriarchy can be associated with Islam, this idea that my, my argument that Islam is a process, if patriarchy can be associated with Islam and become so ingrained in Islam and if other injustices can become so ingrained in Islam, in mainstream traditional uh, Islam, then so can fairness, so can love, so can justice and gender, e gender equality in particular, and all other kinds of equality. We just have to sponsor them in the same ways that historical leaders sponsored their own opinions or specific opinions that they preferred over others. For the next next week when we talk, I'll, I'll, um, for the next week's talk, I'll be highlighting this idea of picking and choosing in Islam. And that contributes to this idea of compassionate change that I'm really, really in favor for here. So for the remainder, remainder of the stack, then I want to highlight this compassionate nature of God that has nurtured my own spiritual growth and, and it gives me hope um, and peace and calm. I'm sure that most of us from, are familiar with the Quranic idea, the Quranic verses that we created, we created the human and we know what their soul whispers to them. We are closer to the human than their jugular vein. And the following hadith, which says, so Allah says, I am just as my worshiper thinks I am, and I am with them if they remember me. If she remembers me in herself, I too remember her in myself. And if he remembers me in a group of people, I remember him in a group that is better than they. And if she comes one span nearer to me, I go one cubit, cubit nearer to her. And if he comes one cubit nearer to me, I go a distance of two outstretched arms nearer to him. And if she comes to me walking, I go to her running. And then there are the names of God, like Rahman and Rahim, and even the word Rab. Rab is an Arabic word that shares a root with the word for to be nurtured, to be sustained, to be raised, like I was raised in a particular you know, household or something. I remember in 2014, I was learning Arabic in Morocco. And I asked my, and, and in our, in our textbook, the word for I grew up in was, it had the same root, it had ra and ba and ba in there. And I remember asking my teacher, wait a minute, is this the same root word? It's the same word as for, for rab? And she didn't know at the time. And I think she checked later and said, yes. And then I did, I looked it up myself in many dictionaries and it turns out it has the same, it's the same root word. And you might, as some of you might have seen that this is why most Sufi scholars um, and authors translate the word Rab as sustainer or nurturer. I prefer that word sustainer myself. God isn't a Lord. It's often translated as a Lord and it's become one of my biggest pet peeves. When I see the word Rab translated as Lord, I feel like it has particular masculinist connotations. Like it's, you know, it becomes this overpowering and one masculine. Rab, Rab is actually not a mask. I mean, if you think about the idea of nurturing, right? We tend to associate that with feminine things. Uh, feminine beings do the nurturing, women, mothers, etc. Lord is not a feminine term whatsoever. Um, so I think I don't think it's I don't think it's a coincidence, and I don't think it's an accident that we decided to stick to the translation of Lord as opposed to sustainer or nurturer. But 
it, it, I feel like the word Lord, when I see it translated, it feels very overpowering, as I mentioned, and very authoritative. Now, Rabb is still being in charge, but simply not in, a, not in an author, authoritative or masculine or terrifying way, but in a loving and compassionate way. I think of it very much, I think of it very much like a, a parent's love for, for their child. Um, and so, you know, you, you shouldn't be ideally in a good, healthy, safe relationship. You're not afraid of your parents, but they take care of you. Maybe there's, you know, consequences for certain actions of yours, but you're not, you're not terrified of your parents. They're not controlling you in any way, ideally. And then there's the words, the, the, the God's names, Rahman and Rahim, as some of us might already be familiar with, these words, these names of God, Rahman and Rahim, share a, a root with the Arabic word for womb, which is literally Raham. There's a Hadith Qudsi, I, I think it's a Hadith Qudsi, where um, that is a it's a Hadith that's attributed to God um, rather than to the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, where Allah tells us that I am God, Allah, and I am the merciful. I created the womb, the Raham, and I, I have given it a name derived from my own name. I think a lot about why it is that this kind of information is often withheld from us, but I'll let you reflect on that um, and why that might be, why, why we have such information withheld from us um, in our little breakout rooms that I'd like to do in, in, in just a bit. The point being that this idea of God, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I reject feminine and masculine uh, or masculinist feminist or exclusionary kinds of uh, views of God. But I do think there's a really interesting pattern here. We've got Rab, we've got Raham, Rahman, Rahim. These are very, very quote unquote feminine terms in the patriarchy. And I wonder if one of the reasons why we don't, we, we don't, because I didn't know that Rahman and Raham were the same or, or, or Raham, the womb was the same thing or had the same root word until very, very recently, maybe just like less than five, six years ago. And it truly changed my life. It changed my relationship with God. When I found out that, Rab, this was 2014, when I found out that Rab meant the same thing or it had the same root word as you know, grew up somewhere, I was nurtured somewhere. I remember it be, being such a magical experience and magical finding for me. It was in 2013 that my teacher had asked me, why are you still a Muslim if there's so much patriarchy in your community? And, I, and I'm mentioning these years because one, I want to highlight the fact that being a Muslim is a journey. It's it's a process and and and, and arriving at a, a kind of Islam that works for you, that is meaningful to you, that is special, that is beautiful, that is loving and, and, and where you have a relationship with God and with Islam that's loving and compassionate is a long, long journey and it's a process. And I, if I'd known that that could happen, I think it would have made the journey a lot easier. It was very lonely being on that journey all by myself. Or not know or feeling guilty that I was feeling these things. And so if you are like that as well, please don't. Please know that you have options and that it's a journey. And whatever conclusion you arrive at is that's that's what's meant for you. And that is that is correct. Because you're going to, you have different experiences that are going to lead you to where you are, where you end up with. So this is why I always find it ironic that the Quran repeatedly, consistently reminds us of the compassionate and of the compassion and mercy of God with the word Rabb being how we invoke God in most of... So my point here, when you... it's I, I think it's ironic that the Quran repeatedly, consistently reminds us that God is compassionate, that God is merciful, that God is our Rabb, right? If you pay attention, and I, I, I did this, I, I went to the Quran one time to, to look for all of the times where the word, the word Rabb appears. There are websites where you can do that, like uh, the Quran Corpus, I think, website has, if you just look up, if you go there and you look for a particular word there, you search for a particular word, it'll tell you all of the verses in the Quran where it appears. If you pay close attention, there's there seems to be a pattern of when the word Rabb appears versus another word for God appears. When we are offering personal individual supplications to God, so particular du'as to God, we are we, we, we use Rabbuna or Rabbi, Right. There are really powerful uh, examples in the Quran of when a particular prophet, Musa alayhi salam, for example, is using the word Rabb versus Allah or some uh, any other words for God that we have the options. I don't think that's an accident. I don't believe that's an accident. I truly believe that the Quran knew what it was doing when it decided this is when this is when the Rabb is going to work better, and this is when Rahman works, and this is when Allah works better. So it's, it's, I think it's worthwhile sitting down and looking through all of those, all of the times that that the, the text uses Rab and uh, versus some other alternative words for God. And I and I feel like the pattern there is very hopeful and powerful. I think it's ironic 
that the Quran emphasizes the mercy of God so much, but in practice, so many of us, myself included, grew up in communities where God is nothing like that. I was just talking to Shadia about my local community mosque here. You enter and their children have written these, um, you know, these beautiful reminders to us. Don't backbite, don't do this, don't speak ill of each other, etc but with images of hellfire in pretty much all of them. So you have a nice little, you know, saying a statement, a hadith or a reminder, and then you get hellfire. Hellfire is like the, it's all over this poster. Just why? And then we get reminders of how cruel God is. God will punish you if you do this, instead of God is also forgiving. God is, God is also compassionate, right? God is, so, I think it's ironic that despite the Quran, despite the word Rahman and Rahim being so common, I mean, every with one exception, all of the 113 verses of the Quran or 114, with one exception, all the 114 verses of the Quran begin with Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in the name of God, most compassionate, most merciful. I, I teach an Abrahamic religions course every fall um, at Mercer University, where I'm an assistant professor uh, of religion. And I teach all my religions, you know, all, all my courses um, on religions in, in a way that recognizes the value and validity of all of them. I do not believe in religious supremacy. I don't believe Islam is superior to any other religion or that other religions are superior to Islam. And I'm so grateful for the religious diversity that we have in our world, as well as in our homes and families and smaller communities that we're a part of. My How my students... Um, some 90, the, the Abrahamic religions course that I teach is, um, it's a first year a course, a freshman course. And so majority, some more than 80% of my students tend to be first year students. How they experience the course depends on what their religious backgrounds are, um, whether they're coming to the course with a preconceived idea of Islam as being aggressive or Muslims being violent and extremist. And some of them do, some of them don't. It's, I, I, you never, I never know what to expect. But one of the most consistently striking things that I hear from my students when they read the Quran, when, the, when they read the Quranic uh, stories of the prophets, um, because we read, uh, we read the, the, the biblical stories, the stories in the Hebrew Bible of the prophets, and then we see how the New Testament uh, with, for Christianity interprets those stories. And then we read the Islamic versions of them um, from, from the Quran. So we'll read the story of Noah sometimes, or Ibrahim for sure, and Musa and Isa and so on. And one of the most consistent things, things that, I, that, I, that I notice that my students will point out is this. They'll express strong surprise that, wow, the God of the Quran is so compassionate. It's, I think one student even said something like, it's as if he doesn't really want to hurt anyone and is looking for excuses not to. Like when God keeps telling the, 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 the prophet, the individual prophet whose story we're learning to go back and warn his people, to go back and warn his people or to teach them how to repent so God can, God can, God can forgive them after they did something so horrible, so bad. When I tell the story of Eve and, and Adam to little Muslim children that I teach the Quran to, they're always in, in complete awe of the fact that God forgives them for their disobedience. There are consequences for their action, but God also teaches them, literally says, I'm going to teach you a prayer. And if you say this, this dua, I'll forgive you. And something that we Muslims still say when we, be, when we believe we have wronged ourselves. So I wonder constantly at what point in my life as a Muslim, did this loving, this forgiving, this compassionate God, my Rabb, your Rabb, become so unforgiving and cruel that the, the image of God in, in our communities is not one of a loving, compassionate God, but one who punishes you. I grew up with an Islam where my, I remember my, my mother would tell me, um, I don't forgive you if you don't cover your hair. Or if you cover, if you don't cover your hair and you leave the house, then Allah will, for every one strand of your hair, like literally just one strand of my hair that a man sees, Allah will put me in hellfire. And the way that this description that I grew up with, it, 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 it's something like, um, like when you're swimming or not swimming, I guess swimming the, the Pakistani way maybe, but like when you're basically, you, you like, you hold your nose and then you just go like this in the water that that's what God is going to do with hellfire. So you'll be, you'll, you'll be, your head will be dipped into the, into the hellfire and then back up and then dipped again for every single strand of my hair that a man saw because I'm not allowed to cover, I'm not allowed to show my hair in public. 
that is the image of God. It's nowhere to be found in the Quran. It's I, I don't even know if it's, if it's a legitimate hadith. I refuse to believe it's a legitimate hadith. And this is what I mean. A part of what I mean when I say it's almost as if that this God that I grew up with is setting women up for sin, right? And for punishment, I'm being set up. It's like, I'm going to create you as a woman and then I'm going to give you this kind of hair and I'm going to inherit, I'm going to teach everybody that women are inherently, right? Sexually distracting. And then if you don't, cover your hair or cover your body, then it's all your fault. And I'm going to put you in hell for, for, for that. And so these images of God, I think are, I mean, they, they affect our body. They affect us in, in really significant ways. I mean, they affect us psychologically, but everything that affects us psychologically also affects us physiologically. So we're carrying this burden of behaving and being a certain way of uh, having a certain relationship with God. And it's not working. It's not working. It just doesn't feel right. They always say, if it if it hurts your soul, if it doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. I find some of our experiences in our communities to be dangerous in, in so many ways, but especially in a minority context, like in the United States, in the 21st century, where we have access to so many other religious traditions, so many other ways of being, so many other ways of being religious, other religions that we can follow. Because this can result in it, it does it can result in our losing Muslims who are questioning things, legitimately so, who are seeking something beautiful, but they don't have it in their communities. Their communities aren't equipped to provide it. To, I, I think the fear is losing them to other religions. The loss here, though, isn't that they become non-Muslims, because keep in mind, I don't believe any one religion is better than any other religion. People have the freedom um, and the right and the option to, to follow whichever religion speaks to them, whichever religion makes sense to them. And whichever religion brings them peace. But it's that the reasons they leave Islam don't need to be there. There are alternatives. We can have alternative experiences. We can practice Islam differently from the ways that our families and our communities and our mosques do it. This is part of why I'm so grateful for Muslim space and for related communities. Uh, I am, I'm, a, I'm a part of many others as well because they allow us to explore Islam on our own terms, to be Muslims on our own terms. Um, and on, the, on that note, I do want to end my talk here. Um, and I want to thank everybody for uh, Muslim Space for inviting me. Um, but before we get to the Q&A, I was thinking that we'll get into breakout rooms of maybe three to four people, depending on how many folks are present. And there are a couple of questions that I want us to reflect on. I'm going to give you the questions here first. I think if we spend about 15-ish minutes in our breakout rooms answering these questions, reflecting on them, um, and then we'll return to the main session, the main room. Um, and discuss our whatever answers you came up with. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A after that until the end. So one of the questions, the first question that I want us to think about is, and I'll copy and paste these in the chat also, what is one change that you're afraid of implementing or even seeing occur in the world around you, in your communities, in your, in your community or in your family or just in, in the world around you? And why do you think you're resistant to this particular change? Why do you think that those who want this change might appreciate might, might appreciate it or be working towards it. And what has your journey on Islam, uh, towards Islam or on Islam been like? What have you struggled with as a Muslim person and how are you navigating that struggle? And third question that I want us to think about is, if someone asked you why you are still a Muslim despite the challenges that you face, if you face any challenges at all, what would you say? I, I'm, this is not to pretend that every Muslim has the same kinds of struggles or even has any struggles at all with Islam. I know Muslims who have absolutely no questions, no doubts, and I'm so glad that they, they don't have that kind of an experience with Islam that I did. Um, but if, if that is not your experiences, if you do have challenges, maybe because of your sexual orientation, maybe because of your gender, maybe because of the way that you practice Islam, what, how are you, how are you, you know, if somebody were to tell you, why are you still a Muslim despite not being accepted for who you are, how might you respond to that question? And then this other question that just occurred to me now is we're, as we've been thinking about a, a kind of God that is so unforgiving and cruel, right? That's, I mean, to be very clear, this is a God that I grew up with um, and it's, it doesn't have to be everybody's God. I, I, I know Muslims and I, I, I think my experience in the Austin community, the Muslim Austin community was, was not at all like what I grew up with in Atlanta, um, where I think the Austin community had a lot more diversity. And so I could go to different mosques if I wanted and I had friends and I had a community where I did feel seen and appreciated and respected for whoever I was. Um, so if you, but if you grew up with, or if you know how popular this idea of, of, a, of a cruel God is in our communities, why do you think that that's the case? 
when, as I said, the Quran is so consistent, not consistently necessarily, but the, the fact that, you know, pretty much every verse, begin, every chapter of the Quran begins with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, compassionate, merciful, etc. Um, and the idea of Rabb being in the Quran and the idea of Raham and Rahman being connected to the womb, uh, which we tend to associate with nurturing and with compassion and connection and so on. Why do you think that is not a very popularly, that's not a very popular idea of, um, of God that we have? Um, in our communities or in, in the mosques or communities that we're a part of. Uh, so I'll stop right there and um, we'll get into our breakout rooms in uh, in just a bit. Okay.